Hey there, Margie Bryce here bringing you the Krabby Pastor podcast. And I don't think you're going to be too surprised to know that it's too easy today to become the Krabby Pastor. Our time together will give you food for thought to help you be the ministry leader fully surrendered to God's purposes and living into whatever it takes to get you there and keep you there. So we're talking about sustainability in ministry. At this point, I was in seminary. And in fact, I finished in 2005. I was ordained in 2003. And I thought maybe Okay, a ministry opportunity will arise when I get ordained in 2003, and that didn't happen. And then I was out of seminary in 2005, and no church situation that fit really came about. So um, I was I was kind of crabby. I was crabby about halfway through seminary when I ran into that master's thesis. I couldn't set that aside. I was no longer just robust and full of my call and rah-rah, because that had been a massive reality check for me. And I came to understand uh, what what could or might not happen. And anyway, I struggled. I struggled mightily. And I struggled so much that one day I decided the healthy thing to do would be to have a funeral for my call. So what I did while I was driving in the car on I-69, I had a graveside service for my call. I buried it, basically, and said that's that's what seemed to be emotionally healthy for me at that particular moment. I was serving as director of marketing at a mission. It's not like I wasn't doing anything productive for Christ and it was a mission that had not had a logo, a newsletter, a, a email list, or nothing. They were starting from scratch, and they had been around you know, many, many, many years. So I was able to do that. And at some point, though, I stepped back from that because I felt like I was somebody's pastor. And I could have done the director of marketing thing without going and doing that beast of an MDiv thing. I could certainly have done that prior to any seminary knowledge, although now I had some theological underpinnings that were not there before. So I don't want to say it wasn't valuable, but in my mind, it, it just didn't make sense. So I did the funeral for my call. I think that was January or February. Maybe it was February of that year. And I have to say, then I received a phone call from a United Methodist pastor friend, and we had camped with them every summer for a number of years. And he would always ask, what are they doing with you? What are they doing with you? And I would just kind of mumble, when in doubt, mumble, right? So I would just kind of mumble, and um, especially the last couple of years when I was kind of on the crabby side of things about this and trying desperately not to be quite so crabby. So he asked me in that phone call, when he called me, it was like right at Easter, which I thought, God knew I would think that was hysterical, that I had buried my call and God was going to resurrect it right at Easter. So I did think that was quite comical on God's part, and God knew I would think that way about it. So he said, I have a guy in my congregation that wants to donate this money for ministry. He doesn't wait till he's dead. Wait until he's dead to give the money. He wanted it to be. He wanted to see it be used for active ministry. And that was the seed money, actually, that was used for my hiring, where I came in on a part-time basis and did some things with contemporary worship and uh, helped with small groups and some visitation. So it was was something, and it was uh, a pastoral role. And I guess what I want to say is that it just takes one person sometimes to get things unstuck, doesn't it? Just one person. So as I was serving there, uh, the United Methodist DS, uh, a couple years in, came to me and said, do you want a church? Which I'm thinking, wow, okay, yeah, sure. 
okay. So she gave me a church that was in great turmoil. They self-described. I didn't know this, of course. You never know this beforehand. But after I got there, they kind of described themselves and said, wow, the DS really sent you into the hornet's nest mess of what we are. And I thought, oh my, all righty then. So the name of the church was Attica. So I can say I did time at Attica. And I wished I would have thought of that at the time, I could have said I was doing time in Attica, but I didn't. Um, and when I got there, there really was not much percolating there. So they did a Sunday thing, and then they all scattered. So I, I said to them, you know, if if we're going down, or maybe I just said it to myself, probably the leadership people, if we're going down here, we might as well go down serving, okay? And I happen to have a couple of people that were interested in a food bank. And since I had worked at that mission, I did have some savvy about where to go for food and, and those kinds of things because that mission was a feeding ministry. So we started um, a food bank there. And uh, and again, uh, it was because I had the people there that were interested and willing and had done some of that in the past. And then uh, down the road, once we got through all the health department whatnots, we started a community meal. So you fast forward to today, and, and I talked to them not too long ago, and they served at uh, during COVID time. And this is like a small bedroom community. There's like there's a gas station. There might be a pizza thing in, in the general store or something. And that's like it. So there's not much there, but they were serving a couple hundred people uh, during COVID. Hmm. So that it's still going. And that was an exciting thing. Um, we did have the other big exciting thing <laughs> that happened while I was there was um, the church almost burnt down. So when you're talking about a 140-year-old-ish structure, the upper part was that. They had done a construction. Uh, it, it sat on a hill. So they did a construction after the fact, and it was a fairly new downstairs area, like a fellowship hall thing. It was much newer downstairs. But upstairs was like a 135-year-old tinderbox, actually. Hey there, this is Margie here, your host of the Krabby Pastor podcast, and I want to urge you to stop surrendering your best self so that you can avoid the burnout that plagues so many ministry leaders. Uh, you don't want to become a Krabby Pastor, that's for sure. So what I've developed is a self-assessment journal style product called Radical Self-Care sustainability for your life and ministry. And what I'm going to do is have the link to it in the show notes so you can go there. It will be the best $29 that you could spend. You can spend then your time. Take time. That's something we don't do when we have big issues. You can take the time to explore how you view self-care and how you need to pursue it a little more. And I'm not about offering you a checklist, that's for sure. But I want to see how self-care can be knit into your heart and into your life so that you can go the distance that God has for you to go. There was a group that met for coffee and they left the coffee burner on and it smoked up the place really good. And I was convinced that the reason that it didn't go up in flames, but just got smoked up really bad to the degree that the uh, furnace filter was like solid black, and it was like $25,000 worth of smoke damage. I thought that the reason that it didn't go up in flames was because I had anointed every doorpost I could get to with oil a few months before and had said and had prayed over the church and, and did that down, even down all the, the aisles and everything. But I definitely anointed the doorpost, which I'm still convinced that that's why there were God's angels standing there. And maybe if a spark happened that they were blowing it out. That's what that's my story. And I am sticking to it. We did get our insurance canceled and had to work through all of that. It, it really was quite the thing. But on the other hand here, I was 
getting uh, correspondence from my Nazarene district asking me to consider moving my credentials to the United Methodist Church, which annoyed me heavily and hurt me greatly. I did go and check into what all that would entail in, from the Methodist perspective, and they told me I needed 32 graduate credit hours from a Senate-approved school. And I thought, I'm not going to go get another master's degree. But I, So I said, well, I might as well go get a doctorate then. And they said, okay. I was hoping I was pointing out the ludicrousy of, of what they were asking me to do. And I I kind of pouted about that, and I was crabby about that, and I was crabby to God, too, about that, and I said, you know, fine, fine, and I would put my hands on my hip. Uh, people that know me would know I would do this. Fine, put your hands on your hip at the same time. If you want me to do more education, then I'm going to have to come up with there's got to be a program somewhere that's workable, that's doable, and that ignites my passion because, frankly, my passions were not ignited at that particular moment. I was less than thrilled with any kind of doctorate thing whatsoever. So you know what happened, and actually it's highly connected to a what used to be called the Come to the Water Wesleyan Clergy Holiness Women's Conference, And we were given a devotional, which turned out to be someone's doctoral thesis work project. And in there, it said she was from Ashland Theological Seminary. So I kind of checked that out. And that's not, I didn't even know where it was. It was like three or four hour drive. And I checked into their programs and they had one that I thought might work, of course, you know, so of course something comes up. But I have to tell you, I whined the whole way through that. Every time I was scheduled to go out for another session, I I would whine to God and say, really, is this really necessary? I mean, I know I'm the queen of overprepared, although I have met some people who are at a higher level than I am on this, but shockingly. But I was just not thrilled about that. But Something just kept pulling me, of course, you know, towards that and into that. And every time I would complain and gripe and whine to God about the the whole thing, God would show me while I was there, it had to be while I was there. I would have liked before, I would have liked the talking cloud, I would have liked, you know, pillar of fire, something. But while I was there, God would show me and, and just confirm to me that that is where I needed to be. And again, what came up again there, I think it was the first thinking class I took. They started talking about, you know, your personal mission statement, your personal, you know, one of those grand self-awareness classes. And I'm not not knocking them, mind you, because self-awareness is like really important. I've come to see later (laughs) rather than sooner, which would have been helpful to see sooner. But in that course, they again stressed getting other people with you, getting an accountability group that the teacher of the class, I don't think he'd mind me saying Terry Wardle, Dr. Terry Wardle, and he's written some amazing books. Just about anything by him is, is great. But he was a church planter who just burnt the candle at both ends and ended up with a emotional breakdown. And had he been doing some other things to care for himself along the way, he would say that might not have happened, especially, you know, I think he had some issues that went undealt with. And, you know, it was so it was more complicated than what I'm making it, I'm sure. So, but again, came up this whole thing of you got to find an accountability group, you got to find some people to journey with. And while I had my husband and in the doctoral process, I had met somebody, especially near the closer to the end, when you're starting to do your dissertation workshops and those kinds of things, named Cindy. And, and we were like the two females in the class. So we, we kind of hung out. I think there might've been, well, there was one or two others. Now I take it back, but Cindy and I kind of bonded a bit. And we basically, we would say we drug each over each other over the line when we were doing our dissertation, you know, we would call and, you know, it was usually, usually one person's time to whine. You know, I whined about an advisor that seemed to be the comma Nazi and 
we were going back and forth about the Oxford comma, and I thought that was ridiculous at this point <laughs> to be doing that. And I just wanted to be finished, and I had done the work, and now you're barking at me about commas. And and she kind of, you know, talked me off of the ledge a, a couple times, I'm pretty sure. So, but the reminder during that process, again, came to get spiritual companions to get accountability. And this was kind of at the very, very beginning of the um, doctoral process. And I tried doing that. I tried finding other women in ministry, other pastors. And in the UM, there's, there's a decent amount. And I tried putting something together and nobody could come at that time. And it was the same thing. You know, it just didn't seem to be a priority within the females that were clergy that I was connected to. So, you know, at one point I was considering going on a retreat anyway, and I started looking online and a friend of mine had recommended this local Jesuit ministry area that did retreats. They did silent retreats. I didn't know how well I'd do on that, but then I thought maybe I would do well on that. But as I'm looking at the website, I realized that they also offered spiritual direction. Well, ring a ding ding. You know, I thought, man, all right. Okay. I knew I would have to pay for this, you know, and it, and it really was pretty minimal that was set by each spiritual director. And I had to interview two or three and then see which one I felt God guiding me towards. But the first one I interviewed was this wonderful, amazing, charismatic Catholic named Kathy. Ooh, charismatic Catholic named Kathy. And (laughs) she was amazing, amazing, amazing. And it was one of the best things that I did up until that point anyway, while I was about, you know, halfway through the doctoral process. And I will share more about Kathy, the charismatic Catholic spiritual director in our next episode. Hey, thanks for listening. It is my deep desire and passion to champion issues of sustainability in ministry and for your life. So I'm here to help. I stepped back from pastoral ministry and I feel called to help ministry leaders uh, create and cultivate sustainability in their lives so that they can go the distance with God and whatever plans that God has for you. I would love to help. I would consider it an honor. And in all things, make sure you connect to these sustainability practices, you know, so that you don't become the crabby pastor. <laughs>